Hey yo. All right, last lecture for the week eight. Um, we're getting into the gas laws, um, and I'm just gonna kind of go through all of the laws, talk to you about them. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the ideal gas law, which is what you guys did your lab on. I'll do a couple practice problems so you can see those worked, um, and then we will call it a week. And thank you guys for being flexible in terms of my schedule this week. I appreciate it very much. All right, so let's talk about what we know. We know about gases. Um, we, we talked about intermolecular forces, and I'm just going back to our um, objectives. So our last time we met, we talked all about um, intermolecular forces. We talked about how those affect surface tension, boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure. Um, we talked a little bit more about uh, phase change diagrams so that we could be prepared for the peanut lab that we did. So what we want to do is we want to get you guys uh, clear on gases, and, and we talked about how um, gases um, are uh, moving constantly. They have lots of space between them. We talked about the four properties of gases, the number of moles, the volume, the pressure, and the temperature. So hopefully you've watched the previous video if you weren't in attendance for lecture on Monday. Okay, so we talked a little bit about atmospheric pressure. We played with that a little bit in the lab. Uh, so I'm hoping you're feeling pretty good about that. Uh, and then we talked about kind of the mathematics of inverse and direct relationships. So I'm hoping that will make sense to you as well. So whenever we look at the gas laws, and we're going to talk about Boyle's, Charles, and Gay-Lussac's, uh, we want to think about the four uh, properties of gases. Pressure, so we have pressure, volume, the number of moles of gas, and the temperature. And when we look at the pressure and the volume relationship, we're gonna keep the temperature and the moles of gas constant. And what we wanna do, I'm gonna just slide over here and have you guys look at an example of this. Um, so when we think about a very um, fuzzy picture, um, we think about the relationship between volume and pressure, we wanna keep going back to that kinetic theory and how pressure is actually produced by the walls of the container being um, bombarded with the gas particles. So when we look at this and we take this expandable um, container and we double its volume, again, I'm sorry for the fuzziness here, we double the volume, you might notice that the pressure goes down. So we said the volume is going to go up, but the pressure is going to go down, and yesterday we called that an inverse relationship. The opposite would be true if we go the other direction. If we, if we decrease the volume, the pressure is going to go up, right, because essentially what's happening is the container is smaller, the number of particles of gas now have more collisions with the walls of the container because the co container is smaller. And just a note on you know the speed, with the temperature we keep the same, so that that's kind of showing that the speed of these guys is moving the same, and we said the number of moles of gas is the same, so we have those same five particles in there to represent that. So when we look at this, we look at what we call Boyle's Law, um, V1, P1 equals V2, P2, which is a mathematical relationship between them. And I'll write that down in our notes in just a moment. The best and the, my most favorite application of this is basically what happens when you take a big deep breath. When you take a breath, you take your diaphragm down, you take this muscle, this big muscle that divides the top and bottom half of your body, you, you create um, a low pressure system in your body because you increase the volume of your lungs. So you take your lungs and you increase the volume by taking your diaphragm down, which basically decreases the pressure in your lungs, so the pressure goes down. And it turns out that the atmospheric pressure out here is larger, and so that forces the air into your lungs when you take a breath. When you exhale, you're pressing your diaphragm up, you're decreasing the volume of the lungs, so your volume of your lungs goes down, the pressure goes up inside your lungs, and so a greater pressure inside is going to actually expel the air out from that high pressure to low. So that's a really good example of Boyle's Law. Okay, so as we go over here and write down our relationship, we would say that as the volume goes up, um, the pressure goes down, Again, thinking about the fact that those particles can't collide, this is an inverse relationship. Relationship. And so basically we put the formula out here, V1, P1, which is our initial condition that first time when we're starting to draw the air into our lungs. And that's equivalent to V2, P2, which is the second condition. So we have this initial condition or our first condition, and then the final condition or our second or our exhale in this case. Okay, so um, an inhale and an exhale 
are a really good example of this. Okay, so Boyle's Law equates pressure and volume. Um, we, we generally keep volume in liters, and pressure can be in anything you want as long as you realize that the units are going to be the same between the first and the second side. So it can be in atmospheres, it can be in millimeters of mercury, it just depends on how you're measuring that pressure. It can be in millibars or tor. Okay, so let's look at the relationship between volume and temperature. Again, thinking about the four properties of gases, when we study volume and temperature, we're gonna keep um, the constants are going to be pressure and number of moles of gas. So Charles' law looks at volume and temperature. So I'm gonna scroll over here. I'm gonna look at Charles' law. So again, a little bit fuzzy. I took these this morning before I left my house. So volume and temperature. So again, what are we representing? Well, we're taking the number of moles of gas the same, right? Um, and we're keeping the pressure the same. So we have five particles of gas. You're seeing that the particles are moving quicker because you're seeing these little lines get faster in here. So we're gonna take the temperature and we're gonna increase it. In order for the pressure to maintain constant, we have to let the container expand and that's what happens is the container expands. So if I double the temperature, notice it's in Kelvin, I double the volume. And again, the opposite's true. If I take these gases and I slow them down, I cool them down because kinetic energy is what we're measuring when we measure temperature, the volume is going to decrease as well. I think most of us know that hot air rises and that's kind of that application. Hot air rising in a hot balloon, right? The other one might be the mylar balloon that you have inside the store and it's a really cold day and you take it outside and it kind of shrivels and shrinks a little bit. Um, and I'll just give my little plug. Mylar balloons are really bad. I picked up a whole bunch of them supping in the ocean. So um, that's kind of a bad thing. Anyway, here's the formula for us. It looks very different because this is a direct relationship where the other was inverse. And that's kind of why I said that is you can kind of tell the formulas when you know the relationship. Okay, let's try to clarify that in your notes. So basically, pressure um, and, and number of moles of gas stay the constant. So V1, T1, V2, T2, right, as volume. Um, it's easier to think about this as temperature. So as we can explain it better, sort of um, as temperature goes up, um, volume also goes up in order to keep the pressure the same. As temperature goes down, Volume also goes down. This is a direct relationship. Okay, um, so you can see that the formula looks different, but again, this is our initial condition, and this is our final condition. Okay, Gay-Lussac's law re relates pressure and temperature, and again, this means that our constants are gonna be volume and number of moles of gas. So this time we're gonna have a rigid container. We're not gonna allow it to expand. And I'm gonna kinda of click on a picture for you so you can see that. I think it's easier to do this one. So here's our example, a little more focus, of Gay-Lussac's law, the relationship between temperature and pressure. Keep thinking about what causes pressure, the collisions of the particles with the walls of the container. Again, I'm gonna double the temperature. Again, my temperature's in Kelvin. And what happens to the pressure? It goes up. So as temperature goes up, pressure goes up, right? As temperature goes down, if we go the other direction, pressure goes down. And so it might make sense to you that that formula looks very much the same, right? Um, so we keep the number, the volume stays constant and the number of moles of gas. And again, as we look at the particles, one, two, three, four, five, that's our moles, one, two, three, four, five. And then our speed, and you can see that the, the little lines here, if you can see those, I'll, I'll erase so you can see them better. The little lines there are indicating that it's moving faster, right? So these are slower and these are faster because temperature, again, is a measure of kinetic energy. Examples of this, this is why we have those labels on the aerosol cans, because you have this rigid container. And even if you have a little bit of gas in there as you heat it, it's going to get really, really high pressure and it can explode, and so that's why um, we, we have that warning on there. A pressure cooker is an example of that too. You have a rigid container, you heat it, the pressure builds, and this is allowing you to cook your food at a higher temperature. It turns out that um, pressure has a lot to do with boiling. 
The newfangled pressure cooker is actually an Instant Pot, right? If you have one of those, it's the same idea. You're cooking things at high temperature, um, high pressure, so that you can cook things at higher temperature, um, and the co food cooks a lot faster. Um, okay, so applications of Gay-Lussac's law. Let's go back and get that in your notes. Um, again, as, um, as temperature goes up, right? as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. As temperature goes down, pressure goes down. That has a lot to do with the fact that um, the particles are moving faster, colliding with the walls of the container with more often and with more force when they're moving at a higher speed. You'll notice that um, the formula is very similar to the one above. And I didn't mention it above, but I'm going to mention it now, just making sure you recognize that whenever we're dealing with temperatures in our gas laws, we always want the temps to be in Kelvin. And that's because we don't want negative volumes and negative pressures and those sorts of things. There is a combined gas law. I'm just going to show it to you. It's kind of the combination of these two laws, essentially. Um, and it, it looks like B1, P1 over T1 equals V2, P2 over T2. If you do the practice exercises we have, we actually have a problem that does that. But you can see it's a combination of Charles and Gay-Lussac's law and takes account um, three variables at the same time with the number of moles of gas being the only constant here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to keep going really quickly and get you all of the data, all of the information, and then we're going to go through some problems. So this is kind of a stretch, and I just want to kind of process this for you. We're, taught, we're kind of going to this concept of molar volume, and I rem, I'll remind you that when we take a mole of any substance, we know the number of particles, right? And we started this conversation on Monday talking about a mole of carbon dioxide. So we know that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of CO2 gas. And we also know that it's 44 grams. And we said, well, this is the molar mass. We also know one other thing about this gas. If we have it at a certain condition, we, we have a, something called the molar volume for only gases. This is only for gases. Okay, so let me walk you through that part. Okay, so if we have a mole of gas and we have it at the same temperature, we're going to imply that it's the particles are moving at the same speed. If they're at the same pressure, that basically means that they're probably occupying the same space, perhaps. Okay, and that's where we're getting there. So what do we know about the number of particles in a mole of gas? We know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And the mass is going to be dependent. So if we have water vapor, it's going to be 18 grams. If we have oxygen, it's going to be 32 grams. If we have carbon dioxide, it's going to be 44 grams. But the application here is there's a lot of things that are the same. About the same speed at which they move, the same pressure, the same number of particles. Only thing different is mass. So it turns out that this is an application of what we call an ideal gas, right? An ideal gas occupies the same space if it's at a condition called STP. So STP, standard temperature and pressure, is zero degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. And if you have one mole of gas at STP, you know all these things about it. You know the number of particles, that's Avogadro's number. You know um, the mass, that would be the molar mass of the, of the substance. And you also know the volume, which is gonna be 22.4 liters. Okay, now the only kind of criteria here, the only thing you have to recognize is this is one mole of gas only at one specific condition at STP. You know you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. You know you have the molar mass of the gas. You have this new conversion factor that if you have a gas at STP, it occupies the same volume, and we call that the molar volume. Now, the problem with that is we don't like to do chemistry at zero degrees Celsius, and not everybody lives in Mount Vernon where the atmospheric pressure is about one all the time. And so what we have to do is we have to have another formula that equates all of those variables together, um, and that is the Pivnert law, Pivnert. Okay, and this is the one you guys just did your lab on. So you have, you have pressure, right? You have volume. 
and the pressure is going to be measured in either millimeters of mercury or atmospheres okay you have um, you have the number of moles of gas let's do a different color here you have the number of moles of gas I didn't do a different color number of moles of gas we have R and this is the ideal gas law constant so let's do that so the ideal gas law constant And that value is going to be different. There's going to be two values, 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin or 62.4 liters millimeters of mercury per mole Kelvin. So if you paid attention in the lab, you know that we use this one. And the reason we use this one is because the units of pressure were millimeters of mercury. If we chose instead to keep the units of pressure in atmospheres, we would have used a different R value in our calculation. And I will show you some of those calculations in just a moment. And then the last one, of course, is the temperature. And we said always we want the temperature to be measured in Kelvin. Okay, so there's all the laws out on the table for you. Um, we've got Boyles, we've got Charles, we've got Gay-Lussac, we have the combined gas law, we have the ideal gas law, and we have this conversation about STP. So what I want to do then is I want to take you guys through calculations that show you how to use all of these laws. Okay, so I would encourage you guys to use your cheat sheet, put all those laws out there, have them available to you. Um, you know, we have to have Boyle's law, we have to have Charles' law. We have to have Gay-Lussac's law. And we have to have the ideal gas law. Okay, and we have to have a, um, the molar volume of 22.4, the STP. So these are all our laws. We have one, two, three, four, five of them. And essentially the hardest part I think is deciding which law to use, okay? So I'm gonna demonstrate how you might go about doing this. I would encourage you guys to just take the data out of the table, organize it and label it, and then you can figure out what laws to use. So I'm looking at this one, here's the breath again, right? Um, the lungs expanding from four liters to 5.6 liters. So that would in indicate that at the initial volume of the lungs was 4.5 liters and the final volume of the lungs was 5.6 liters. It tells us the initial pressure is 756 millimeters of mercury, and it's asking us what is the pressure inside the lungs before any additional air is pulled in. Kind of worded a little bit funny, but basically it's saying, well, what is the pressure right before I add any more um, air, right? So we'll talk about the initial pressure is 756 millimeters of mercury and they're asking us for the final pressure that's our unknown these are just plug and chug problems recognizing what formula that you need to use plugging in the variables and solving for the unknown so i'm hoping that you guys are noticing that that would be this law right here Boyle's law because i'm dealing with volume and pressure and I like to tell students that they can pick how they like to do this, but when we put this law out here, P1V1 equals P2V2, we're identifying that we wanna solve for this variable right here. So I always encourage students to solve the equation for the missing variable and then plug in the things that they need to plug in. So you may algebraically be pretty solid on this and you know that P1V1 over V2 is gonna be p two and so then you just plug things in so we plug in our p1 of 756 millimeters of mercury we plug in our v1 of 4.5 liters we divide that by 5.6 liters we do that math and we end up with an answer so we're taking 756 times 4.5 and we're dividing that by 5.6, and we get um, a pressure reading of 607, and I'm rounding that up to eight because I'm gonna stick with three sig figs, millimeters of mercury, 
and you can see that all the units are going to cancel except for that one. And then we ask the question, does this make sense? And so we ask the question, well, the volume is going up, so the pressure should go down, and that actually makes sense. And so that logically makes sense. Okay, let's keep going. So the next one, again, word problem, nobody likes those, um, but we just kind of look at it and we figure out what we know and what we're asked for. So in this one, it's saying we've got this balloon at 2.2 liters. We know that um, it had it's at 25 degrees Celsius and we're gonna cool it down to minus 78 and we wanna know what the new volume is. And so basically, we recognize that law as um, the volume temperature law, right? So we look at that and we go, oh, that must be this law right here. And again, we're just going to label things. So I'm going to call V1 is equal to 2.2 liters. V2 is what we're asking for. Um, T1 is 25 degrees Celsius. And T2 is minus 78 degrees Celsius. Our law is... Uh, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We're asked to find V2, so we solve this equation for V2, and we end up with um, V1 times T2 divided by T1 is equal to V2, because we're going to multiply both sides by T2 to get that off the denom out of the denominator. So then we're solving this equation, but we have one problem. We want to make sure that our units of temperature are in Kelvin. So we're going to add 273 to this number, and we're going to add 273 to that number. So when we do that, we get 273 plus 25, which is um, 298. So we get 298 Kelvin. So we're going to plug that in for T1. So um, on the bottom here goes two, oops. This goes to 98 Kelvin. And T2 is um, negative 78. So negative 78 plus 273 is 195. So this is 195. And I, I should write this down as 298. So in for T2 goes 195 Kelvin. So I've got my two values for temperature in there. And then my volume can just go in. So V1 is 2.2 liters. I do that math, 2.2 times 195, and divide that by 298. 2.2 times 195, divided by, and I get 1.4 liters. So my volume is 1.4 liters. So my temperature went down and according to our law, we said the volume should also go down. So again, that makes sense. Okay, keep going. Um, this one again, an autoclave, right? It's a pressurized container to sterilize medical equipment. Um, we're starting at 100 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. Um, we're heating it up to 150 degrees Celsius and we'd like to know what is the new pressure. So we recognize that as um, the third of the three laws, right? So we look at that one and we go, that one must be Gay-Lussac's uh, Gay law, right? And so we look at that and we go, okay, well, P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. We take out what we know. We know the initial temperature is 100 degrees and the initial pressure is one atmosphere. We know that the final temperature is 150 degrees, and we, we're looking for the final pressure. We can expect that the pressure is going to go up because our temperature is going to go up. We're solving for P2, and so again, same math to get to P2 as before. So we need T2 times P1 over T1 equal to P2. We want to make sure our units are in the right unit, so we're going to add 273 here to get 373 Kelvin, and we'll add 273 to 150, and we'll get 273 to 150, and we'll get 423, so we add 273, 273 plus 150, 423, and we just plug those in, and this is not too bad because we have this one atmosphere in here. So our T2, we want to make sure we put the units in the right place, 423 Kelvin times our one atmosphere divided by 
373 Kelvin. And then we do that math, which is just going to be 423 divided by 373. So we get a pressure of 1.13 atmospheres, which doesn't seem like a lot, um, but atmospheres are kind of big units. Um, and we know that as the temperature goes up, our pressure should also go up. So that kind of corroborates. Okay, so those are the three gas laws. I want to continue to talk about um, this, this STP conversation. And STP just becomes a conversion factor. Um, we know that for every 22.4 liters of gas, um, we know that it's one mole. And, but it's only at the condition of STP. Remember, STP is zero degrees Celsius and um, one atmosphere pressure. But it uh, prevents us from having to plug in too much. We can just basically um, convert. So if I look at four moles of any gas, it doesn't have to be argon. I start with what I know. I start with my four liters of gas. And I know that at STP, for every 22.4 liters, I get one mole. In this case, it's argon. So I'm just going to do that division of 4 divided by 22.4, and I get 0 0.18 moles of argon, which hopefully makes sense. When we compare 4 liters to 22.4 liters, we know that it, we're not going to have very much. We have about um, 2 tenths of a mole. So that's kind of how that works. It's not too bad. The only time you have to worry about something like this is if you had 120 milliliters you'd want to convert this first to liters and then do the math, right? So you want to make sure your units match just like you always do when you're doing dimensional analysis. Okay, that's going from, um, from liters to moles. That's going from volume to moles of gas, right? So from volume to moles of gas using this new relationship that we have, 22.4 liters. We also want to be able to go from mass or moles to liters. And so if we look at this one, this one is just going to be the opposite. If I end up with 4.2 moles of argon, I know that for every one mole of argon, I'm going to have 22.4 liters. This is at STP, remember. So it means I'm going to have a whole bunch of volume because four liters of gas, four moles of gas is going to take up a lot of space, right? So when I multiply 4.2 times 22.4, I get about 94 liters of argon gas four times as much volume about because I have four moles of gas. Now the only problem here is this isn't in moles, this is in grams. So we're going to have to do a conversion of grams to moles and then moles to liters. Again, add STP. Super powerful tool, our dimensional analysis. We start with that 2.1 grams of nitrogen. We know that for every 28 grams of nitrogen because one atom of nitrogen is 14 and so when we double that we get 28. We know that's one mole of nitrogen and we know that for every one mole at STP it's 22.4 liters. So we'll do that math. 2.1 we're going to divide by 28. We're going to multiply by 22.4 and we're going to get 1.68 liters. 1.68 liters or 1.7 liters of nitrogen gas. Again, just kind of thinking about that, a hard one to sort of contemplate, but if I only have two grams, I have about a tenth of this, so it should be about a tenth of that, right? So it's hard for us to think that through, but it's important for us to just consider and see if that makes sense. Okay, last example. Um, I think we're going to do the lungs because we've been sticking with the lungs for a bit. It wants to know how many moles of air are present in the lungs. So how many moles of air are present in the lungs? If the volume is 5 liters, the temperature is body temperature, and the pressure is 740 millimeters of mercury, a little bit lower than our atmospheric pressure, right? So because this is, does not say STP, does not say STP, okay, we know because we're looking at moles, we're looking at volume, we're looking at temperature, and we're looking at pressure, and because we don't have an initial and a final condition, Okay, we don't have that. It's just one condition. We know this is pivnert. So we know it's not at STP. We know there's not an initial and final condition like there are for all the other gas laws. We know that we're just going to use pivnert. So this is much like what you guys did in your lab. So we just plug and chug here. So we want to know. We don't know what N is. 
We know the volume is five liters. We know the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And we know the pressure is 740 millimeters of mercury. So then we're gonna plug everything in, but the only thing we wanna worry about is the fact that this isn't in Kelvin. So we're gonna take 37 and add 273. 37 plus 273. So we get 310 Kelvin. We wanna solve the equation for N. We wanna solve the equation for N. So we're gonna look at this equation and solve for N. Algebra says let's divide by RT. So we get PV over RT is equal to moles. So we're going to plug everything in. We have um, 740 millimeters of mercury for our P. We have 5 liters for our V. So I'm looking at that right there, and I'm looking at that right there. I'm going to continue. I'm going to put my temperature in here as 310. And then I just want to talk a little bit about how we determine R. If you recall, we said R is determined by the unit of measure for our pressure. And as you recall from our lecture a moment ago, I said that the value for R is going to be 62.4 liter millimeters of mercury over mole Kelvin. And I'm just belaboring that for a moment because I want to I want to show you why those units are so weird. So I'm solving for N. So I should have units of moles. And so I'm going to just show you how these units cancel. So millimeters of mercury cancel. Liters of gas cancel. Um, Kelvin, you can see cancels as well. Kelvin cancels with Kelvin. So I'm left with moles here, which is kind of weird because it's in the denominator. But if you're a math person, you know that 1 over 1 over moles means I'm going to flip and multiply. So I'm actually am going to get moles, which is what I want my unit for my answer to be in. And that's why the units of this constant are so funky. Ultimately, we're just going to do that math. We're going to multiply 740, 740, 740 times 5. And we're going to divide that by, and I'm going to put this in parentheses so I don't mess this up, 62.4 times, whoops, 62.4 times 310 and I get three time, uh, three, let's see, 3.06 times 10 to the, I wanna erase this, times 10 to the negative fourth moles. Okay, I'm checking that math one more time just because I have a better calculator here. So 740, I always have to check my math twice, 740 times five divided by 62.4 times 310, and I get the wrong answer. So this is wrong. I did something weird here, so I'm going to go back and try that one more time. 740 times 5 divided by 62.4 times 310, and I get 0, 0 0.19 moles of, in this case, it's air in our lungs, right? which is not something that we really pay attention to, but it's a good endeavor to sort of play with this a little bit. And I, just, I stuck with two sig figs because that's kind of what I was given in my numerics. Okay, there you go. We've applied all the laws. We've done the problems. I'm hoping you guys are feeling okay with this. I know you guys are tired. I'm going all the way back here and just making sure that we can convert between pressure units. You've done that in the lab. Um, you understand the relationship between volume, moles, temperature, and pressure, and you can apply the gas laws, and you can do the ideal gas law, which is what we did for our lab. So I think you guys should be good with this. Your lab for the peanut is due on Sunday, and I can't remember when the gas law lab is due, but we might as well have it due soon as well, so you can get that off your plate and begin to study for your final. Thanks, you guys. I hope you're having a great day. Bye.